Now I've been looking at this chart here and you can find a link to the video where I got this chart. But Ken has been looking at these solar eclipses over the course of about 14 years from about 2014 to 2029 or 2030 or something like that. And it seems like they all are pointing to the second month, 5-16-2022. That's actually second Passover in the year 2022. Now, what occurs on May 16th of the year 2022 is a lunar eclipse one of two lunar eclipses in the year 2022. Now, you hear about second Passover in the book of Numbers chapter 9, when you had these individuals who were unable to keep the first Passover in the first month, were told by our Father through Moses that they could keep the Passover in the second month. These people were given a second chance because of the importance of Passover. And you see the application of this ordinance in 2 Chronicles chapter 30 when King Hezekiah, who had just found out about the law, commanded all of Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month because they had missed it in the first month. So. Let's go into the scripture and let's take a closer look at second Passover. Now, like we talked about earlier, the one time that we hear about somebody keeping the feast of Passover in the second month is in second Chronicles chapter 30 with King Hezekiah. He commanded all of Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month because they wasn't aware of the law in the first month. And when he understood numbers chapter nine, he took advantage of it and had all of Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. But one thing that's truly interesting about how Hezekiah kept the Passover in the second month is that he not only commanded all of Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month, but he invited all of Israel, the other ten tribes, to come to Jerusalem and keep the Passover with him. In other words, all of Israel for the first time since the days of Solomon were unified and kept the feast days together there in Jerusalem. Now, of course, this living parable is significant in our times because the Jews that were in Jerusalem would represent spiritual Israel of today. Those people who are obeying the covenant of the Lord and the other 10 tribes of Israel would represent those who love the Lord but wasn't necessarily keeping the commandments and would be represented by the Gentile church today. So this unification of Israel and Judah would be symbolic of the unification of spiritual Israel and Christians today. And the fact that it happened on second Passover makes it extremely significant. This reunification of all of the children of the Most High reminds me of the regathering that we hear about in Matthew and chapter 24 and verse 31. See where it says he will gather the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Well, when you look in the Septuagint translation of the book of Jeremiah in chapter 31 and verse 8, you see that this gathering will take place at the Feast of Passover. It seems to be saying the same thing that we read about over there in the book of Matthew when it's talking about regathering the remnant of Israel and Jacob from the ends of the earth. But notice that this gathering that he talks about is to the feast of Passover and when we look in the book of 2nd Esdras in chapter 2 and verse 38 we see that it's also talking about the feast of the Lord which would include Passover but this time it's talking about those that will be sealed during the feast of the Lord and notice how in verse 39 it's talking about how they receive these glorious garments of the Lord and verse 40 also talks about these garments when it says shut up those of thine that are clothed in white and when we come to the book of Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14 we also hear about these white garments 
And here we hear that they are made white in the blood of the Lamb. And of course, it's talking about the 144,000 and the multitude that no man can number. Well, if we jump to Revelation chapter 12, we hear about those same people. And we also hear about this blood of the Lamb that made their garments white. And when we look at the entire chapter 7, we see that it's talking about the sealing of the 144,000. Well, that's what 2nd Esdras was talking about, the sealing at the Lord's feast. And Jeremiah was talking about the gathering to the feast of Passover. Now, we talked about Revelation chapter 12 earlier when we were talking about the 1,290 days. Well, notice in verse 11 that it's also talking about the blood of the Lamb. And it was through that blood of the Lamb that they overcame the wrath that you hear about in verse 12. And when we come over and look at the book of Romans in chapter 5 and verse 9, we see that we are to be saved from his wrath by his blood. And when we look at the book of Revelation in chapter 6, when we hear about the great day of his wrath, we see some of the events that are to take place, like stars falling from heaven and great earthquakes, which all sounds very similar to what we heard about back there in Egypt during the first Passover, during Moses' time. Notice over here in the book of Jubilees in chapter 49 and verse 15, where it's telling us that those who keep the feast of Passover don't have to worry about plagues or wrath or that kind of thing for the entire year in which they keep the feast of Passover. So that's what Romans in chapter 5 is talking about when it says that we are justified by his blood and saved from wrath. But how does that work? What is the connection between his blood, our atonement, our salvation, and protections from the day of wrath? Well, when we come to the book of Matthew chapter 26, we see the Messiah and the feast of Passover. We see that it was on the evening at the beginning of Passover that he had the communion celebration with the wine and the unleavened bread that we hear about that what they call the Last Supper. The Messiah, who was the representation of the Passover lamb, whose blood was put on the doorposts in Egypt to protect the Lord's people from the plague of the death angel, now has replaced that blood with wine. And he's telling us to drink this wine every year during the Feast of Passover so that we can have the remission of sins so that we don't have to worry about the plagues coming up on the world. So there is how we get our protection from the day of wrath. We do so by having the communion feast on the evening of Passover. This all makes sense when we look back at the book of John in chapter 6 verses 53 through 54 when he's telling us that by partaking in the communion festival we receive eternal life and it goes on to say that those who kept the feast of Passover will be raised up at the last day well that's what's being talked about over in the book of first Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 when it says that the dead in Christ will rise first and in first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 52 when it's talking about the dead shall be raised incorruptible of course, those verses are what they talk about when they are referring to the rapture. But when we look back at the gospel according to John, we see that drinking the Messiah's blood and eating his flesh is necessary to be raised up during that time. So Passover is necessary for the rapture. If you want to be sure that you're going to be raptured and have eternal life, you must keep Passover. So that would be why our father gave us two chances in a year in order to get that day right. So why am I telling you all of this? Is it to scare you? Absolutely not. The purpose of this video is to bring your attention to second Passover and the importance of having the communion festival on that day.
but I'm absolutely sure that if you want eternal life and or want to be raptured you're going to have to keep the feast of Passover so by now I'm sure many of you are asking exactly how do you keep the feast of Passover and another question you should be asking is when do you keep the feast of Passover because if you remember the story of the Messiah he was crucified during the daylight hours of Passover but they had the Last Supper on the evening before that is because the feast of Passover starts the evening of the 14th that would be the time to put the blood on the doorposts so that would be the time to have the Passover communion festival so you want the fruit of the vine whether it be grape wine or grape juice and your unleavened bread there at your own home and you will perform a Passover ceremony reading verses that pertain to the feast of Passover while you drink the wine and eat the bread in remembrance of the Messiah now you may have seen one of these popular videos about the 144,000 on our channel we have been teaching about that group since 2018 if you haven't seen these videos I'll give you a link at the end of this one so that you can check those out but in this video we want to talk about how many of the 144,000 are about to get their sealing that seal that we hear about over in Revelation chapter 7 so if you feel like you may be one of the 144,000 you want to pay particularly close to this video and the scriptural information that I'm about to present or you may miss that sailing opportunity so let's get started the first thing I want to do is bring you back over to chapter 39 out of the third testament of the Bible as we briefly talk about who the 144,000 are we see in verse 40 out of chapter 39 how our father will be using this 144,000 for a great mission and this great mission is to save humanity from extinction see this tribulation or this apocalypse that we are facing threatens to annihilate all life from our planet but our Heavenly Father intends for humanity to go on so he has set aside 144,000 individuals equipping them with the tools that they need not only to survive the tribulation but to help a multitude that no man can number to survive as well those individuals that will go on to inherit the earth now you hear a lot of people talk about being 144,000 many people will stand up and say they are 144,000 even though the selection process hasn't started yet nobody will know for sure that they are 144,000 until they receive that seal that we hear about in Revelation 7 but like we see in verse 44 there are many who take on the name of the 144,000 for vanity's sake or for a desire to feel secure there are some religions that teach that the 144,000 are the only ones that survived the tribulation so since many people are afraid of death they take on the name of the 144,000 thinking that by doing so they will increase their chances of being saved and there are others who take on the name like we said for vanity's sake with no intention on completing that mission that we hear about or doing the work that the 144,000 are called to do in this tribulous time we see in verse 46 that the 144,000 are channels in which our father uses to communicate with humanity from the spirit world these guys are messengers or envoys they are our father's instruments that he will use like we said to save humanity we see in verse 55 that their destiny is to throw light on the path of their brothers in other words to teach the rest of us what we need to know in order to survive the tribulation we learn in 57 that these guys are like lifeboats they are guardians and counselors and strongholds equipped with the tools and weapons in order to fulfill this divine mission 
sure the rest of us will have this opportunity to get these tools and weapons but we see in verse 59 that our father intends to start with this 144,000 like the parable which says that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which is hid in three measures of meal till the whole lump is leavened our father has put a lot of time and effort into training these individuals like soldiers and we see in 55 like we'll see in Revelation chapter 7 once these guys are sealed then many of the end times events will start to take place matter of fact let me read verse 7 it says when those chosen by me find themselves reunited round my law the earth and the stars will be shaken and in the sky there will be signs well this is what Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3 is talking about when it says hurt not the earth nor the sea nor the tree till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads so now do you see a connection here both of these passages are talking about catastrophic events that will devastate the earth and both are also talking about the 144,000 being prepared before this devastation starts notice that in chapter 7 it says that this 144,000 have to be sealed in their foreheads while back in the third testament it says that they have to be reunited round my law this should all remind you of Matthew chapter 25 and the ten virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom to return five of them had oil and the other five didn't well in this video we're going to talk about what that oil is so that you could be ready like you read about over there in 2nd Peter in chapter 1 when it's talking about the calling of the 144,000 there are a lot of people that are filling that calling maybe even millions to fill the call of the mission of the 144,000 but only few will be chosen so like Peter is telling us we have to make that calling an election sure meaning we have to do what we have to do in order to be sure that we get that ceiling that John was talking about in chapter 7 so let's come back over to the book of Revelation and let me show you a common thread related to the 144,000 you see further down in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14 it's saying that they are those who came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb and we're in Revelation chapter 12 it says and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9 we see that it is by this blood that we are saved from the wrath of God so the question is what is the relationship between the blood of the Messiah and the sealing of the 144,000 now there are a lot of people who are not candidates for the 144,000 that will try to tell you that simply by the Messiah dying on the cross his blood was shed and we now have the forgiveness of our sins and we don't have to worry about the law and we all have eternal life which to them means that there's nothing that we have to do in order to receive eternal life or salvation but when they say that I always think of the evil people of the world and I think so if there's nothing we have to do to be protected by his blood then his protections must cover everybody on the planet including people like Joseph Stalin or Kim Jong Il or Mao Zedong or even Hitler and when I bring it up then they start trying to add caveats to it saying well you must believe in Christ in order to be redeemed by his blood well to that I say Hitler was a Christian too when you look at his book Mein Kampf you see that he wrote about our father all throughout that book even going as far as to say that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior in fact a lot of what he did he did in the name of God he thought that by exterminating the Jews he was doing God's work and he would be blessed for it so did his belief in God get him eternal life 
Is he now in heaven looking down on the rest of us because he simply believed? There are many people in the world who want you to think that all you have to do is believe and you will be covered by the blood of Christ. And I'm sure they'll come up with another caveat that I haven't yet thought about yet, but who these people are that try to interfere with what it really takes to get your ceiling are who the Messiah said are like dogs sleeping in the manger with the oxen. These people have no intention of getting their ceiling or surviving the tribulation, nor do they want you to get your ceiling, nor do they want you to survive the tribulation either. So we really have to learn to ignore those people. We're talking about 144,000 individuals out of 8 billion. That means there are only one out of 55,000 people that would actually receive this ceiling who will actually make this calling an election sure. In other words, only 0.002% of all of humanity is willing to do what it takes in order to be counted as one of the 144,000. So, what does it take? Let me bring you over here to Luke chapter 22 and show you a commandment of the Messiah that is often ignored, even more so than in Matthew chapter 5 when he says that we must fulfill the law. When you look at verse 19 of Luke chapter 22, he says, do this in remembrance of me. This is the Messiah talking and this is a commandment. He doesn't say you could do this or even that you should do this. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And what is he talking about? The communion feast that he held at what they call the Last Supper, when he took the cup of the fruit of the vine and divided it amongst the disciples and told them to drink. And he broke the bread and told them to eat, saying that that was the blood of the new covenant and the bread required for eternal life. He goes in much more detail in John chapter 6 when he's talking about this bread and this wine, saying that they who partake in this communion festival on Passover will have eternal life and going as far as to say that those who don't have no life in them at all. So you say, what's the connection between all of this? The 144,000 being sealed, the Passover, the bread and the wine. Well, when you look in the book of 2nd Esdras, chapter 2 and verse 38, you see it's talking about the 144,000 being sealed at the Lord's feast. And when you look at Jeremiah chapter 31 in the Septuagint translation of the Bible, you see in verse 38, that the Lord's feast that he's talking about is the feast of Passover. See how he says that he will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of Passover. It is during the feast of Passover that we receive our sealing. And because the 144,000 will be the first to understand this and will be the first to keep communion on the feast of Passover, they will go on to teach the rest of us to keep the communion feast of Passover as well. And like you see over here in the epistle of the apostles, it's necessary in order to keep the Passover every year while the rest of the world is paying attention to other stuff that they can do nothing about. It is the 144,000 that will be fulfilling the requirements necessary for eternal life, for salvation and to get their seals. But now here we are in May and many of you guys who are candidates for the 144,000 failed to keep the Passover back in April. But when you look in the book of Numbers in chapter 9, you see that there is a such thing called second Passover, which means that you actually have another chance. And that's why I'm doing this video to make you aware not only of the requirement of the communion festival on Passover, but to let you know that you still have another chance in order to fulfill that requirement. And after that, 
you will continue to do Passover every year to be sure that you will maintain your seal and be ready to perform the missions of the 144,000 when you are called to do so. Now here is my wife's recipe for unleavened bread because it's difficult to find it in the stores so you may have to make your own. So get your bread, get your wine, and get ready to have the communion feast so that you can get your seal. If you don't, you're not going to be one of the 144,000, calling or not. Our Father's word is not to be played with, and he don't make exceptions. There will be many called, but few will be chosen for these missions. So, if you truly want to be one of the ones chosen, you better do what you have to do in order to keep the festival. And in this video, I'm going to show you the relationship between the third temple and the feast of Passover. First, I'm going to show you by way of scripture how the third temple will actually be a spiritual temple. And then we're going to look to see how that temple will actually be built on the hearts of humanity. And then lastly, we're going to show you what exactly you have to do in order to make sure that you are part of that third temple. So let's get started. Now, one of the first verses that I want to bring to your attention is 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. In this verse, you see the word temple mentioned three times. One in which it says that we are the temple. But now, when we come over to the Strong's Concordance and we look this verse up in the Interlinear Bible, we see that when it's referring to temple, it uses Strong's number G3485. And when we come over and look at the definition of 3485, it says a temple. But then when you look at the usage, it says a shrine that part of the temple where God himself resides. Now let me bring you over to Matthew chapter 26 where now we have the Messiah talking about the temple when he said I sat daily with you teaching in the temple in verse 55 and then when we look down in verse 61 of that same chapter you have his accusers talking about how he said he would destroy the temple. Now, when we come back over to the concordance and we look for these verses, we only see verse 61 and verse 55 is not here. And when we look closely at verse 61 in the interlinear Bible, we see that, yes, the word temple there has Strong's number 3485. But then when we come to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 55 in the Interlinear Bible and look at the word temple, it has Strong's number 2411. And when we look at 2411, it also says temple. But then when we look at the usage, it says a temple, either the whole building or specifically the outer courts open to worshipers. So here we have the word temple used two times in the same chapter, but they have different meanings. In verse 55, the Messiah is saying that he sat teaching in the temple. And in that verse, he's talking about a building. But then in verse 61, when he's talking about how the temple will be destroyed and built up in three days, he's talking about the place in which God dwells. So this makes it clear that there are actually two kinds of temples being talked about in the New Testament. You have the brick and mortar temple that was first built by Solomon and restored by Zerubbabel. But then you also have the temple of Christ or the body of Christ. And what's even more interesting is that the brick and mortar temple Concordance number 2411 is not used in the book of Revelation at all. Even though you see the word temple in books like Ephesians, Thessalonians, and Revelation, it's never talking about concordance number 2411. It's only talking about the body of Christ. It's only talking about that same temple that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. 
So the third temple that we hear about in the book of Revelation is not a brick and mortar temple at all. It is a spiritual temple. It's that sanctuary that we hear about in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 17, which is established by the Lord's hands, not by the hands of man. This is confirmed over in Acts chapter 7 and verse 38 when it says that the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The third temple is not a brick and mortar temple. That is a spiritual temple like we see over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. We are the stones that make up that temple. We are the building material of the third temple. So how is this temple constructed? And for that, we must jump over to the book called the General Epistle of Barnabas. In chapter 8, verse 11 is where it starts talking about the construction of the third temple. You see how he's going to explain this process to us. But notice how he says that there are miserable men deceived after putting their faith in a brick and mortar temple. A temple not made by our creator, but made by humans. In other words, these men are miserable because they have constructed a building thinking that that somehow will house our father and creator who is infinite. In verse 13, he's quoting the book of Isaiah when he says, Who has measured the span of heaven and the earth with his hand? He says that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. What is this house that we think we can build for him? How do we think we could build a place for him to rest in? Know therefore that their hope is in vain. Talking about those who put hope in a man-made temple. Then in verse 14, we see him talking about how the Messiah said that the temple would be torn down and built up again in three days. And we've already established that he's not talking about that temple that took them 40 years to build, but he's actually talking about the body of Christ and how it would be built up in three days. Verse 15 is talking about how the second temple would be destroyed, which it was. And since this book of Barnabas was written after the second temple was destroyed, you understand the question in verse 16 when it says, does God have a temple? And the answer to that question is that, yes, our father does have a temple. But notice that it says that he is the one that perfected it or built it. Now, verse 16 also has an interesting point. That we won't cover too much in this video, but notice how he says as soon as the week is completed, the temple will be constructed. That week that he's talking about, we see in this same chapter in verse 3. He's talking about the 7,000 years of human history and how that third temple will be constructed at the beginning of the 7,000th year. But we'll save that for another class. We're now talking more about how the third temple will be constructed and not so much as when it would be constructed. But if you are interested in when it will be constructed, make sure you hit that subscribe button because we'll definitely be talking about that in future videos. Now let's come back and look at verse 17 where he's about to tell us how this temple will be built in the name of the Lord. He says that he's going to show us how this temple is to be built. In verse 18, he's making a comparison between the brick and mortar temples and our corruptible bodies, saying that before we came into the belief of our father, the habitation of our hearts was corruptible and feeble. Verse 19 says it was a house of idolatry, a house of devils. In so much that we did whatsoever was contrary unto God. But nevertheless, he says that this third temple will be built there. So how is that going to work? Well, I believe that's the message of the Messiah when he said that the temple had to be destroyed first and rebuilt. Well, again, in verse 20, he lets us know that he's going to tell us how that glorious temple is going to be built to replace that corruptible temple.
verse 21 says having received remission of our sins and trusting in the name of the Lord we are become renewed being again created as it were from the beginning wherefore God truly dwells in our house that is in us so what this is telling us is that in order for our father to dwell in our spiritual temple it first has to be made incorruptible and whereas before it was feeble now our fleshly temples must be made strong and how is this done by the remission of our sins see we have to remember that it is sin that separates us from the father of course he never moves he's still in the same place but when we have sinful hearts we can't commune with him we can't hear that small still voice that speaks through our conscience when we are in a sinful state which we all were until we got the remission of sins it says that after we receive the remission of sins and trusting in the name of the Lord we became renewed being again created as if it were from the beginning so now we have a clean slate and we can commune with our father once again like we did in the beginning and it is then that our father will truly dwell in our spiritual temples so when do we get this remission of our sins when we come and look for the word remission in the Bible we see that it is mentioned ten times the first time being in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28 when it says for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins now this is actually talking about the communion festival of Passover are you seeing the connection here in order for our bodies to be changed to the dwelling place of our father we have to have our sins canceled out we have to have the remission of sins and what the Messiah is telling us is through the communion festival that we partake in on Passover we get that remission so keeping the communion festival on Passover just like they did back during the Last Supper is necessary for the construction of the third temple to be built on our hearts you see it's also talking about the New Testament or the New Covenant I remind you again to hit that subscription button because we'll be doing another class Lord willing in the future to talk about the relationship between Passover and the New Covenant now the next time that we see the word remission in the Bible is in Mark chapter 1 and verse 4 when it's talking about how John the Baptist preached the baptism of repentance and remission so these two things go together first we are baptized into the body of Christ where all of our sins are canceled out but of course humans are sinful our father in his infinite wisdom gave us the communion festival every year at Passover in order to renew that cleanliness state so it's necessary to be baptized once but then to keep the feast of Passover every year in order to maintain our tabernacles and a state clean enough for our father to dwell there so after all of that lead up that Barnabas did as he was preparing us to learn how the third temple was being constructed what it boils down to is baptism and the yearly renewal of that cleanliness state through the feast of Passover and since most of us have been baptized at least once now it is up to us to be sure that we keep the Passover every year in order to keep our temples active and that kind of reminds me of the first Passover when the congregation was told that if they don't keep Passover then they would die well the way I understand it now if we don't keep the Passover each year now we will suffer a spiritual death and when we look in the book of John chapter 6 
the Messiah makes it even more clear the importance of keeping the communion festival on Passover when he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And yes, that'll be another class that we'll be given in the future, Lord willing, on the necessity of the Feast of Passover and the resurrection of the dead. So again, make sure you have that subscription button push so you can see those classes when they come out. And for the next week, you should keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In order to make sure that your heart is prepared for the beginning of the construction of the third temple. And you will remember to keep the rest of the feast during the year. And be sure to keep the feast of Passover every year. And may our Father bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.